thank you everybody for your patience. We will start now with the next session. This session is from Klaus Graf, the Associate Professor from the Department of Health Science and Technology in Aalborg University in Denmark. And it's our absolute pleasure to have him with us today to talk about his research experiences with the MUSE system. Just so as you know that this session will be recorded and there is a possibility to ask questions via Slido. So there's information on the bottom of each slide on how to log in and log your questions. So Klaus, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. <clears throat> and thank you for allowing me to um, share our research experiences uh, with the MUSE system. So my background is in biomedical engineering and um, I've been administrator of the um, research MUSE database that we have here at Albo University uh, for 12 years now. So let me first um, start by drawing up the landscape of um, uh, next, uh, the landscape of um, MUSE systems that we have in Denmark. So Denmark is divided into um, five regions and each region feeds ECG data into its MUSE system. Some regions like the northern part um, where I'm located have both a research MUSE and a clinical MUSE um, at the university. Um, and our capital region of Copenhagen also has um, two MUSE systems. Next. I mentioned the different MU systems in Denmark because um, I want to emphasize that it's possible to share data between MU systems, and this is something that we use for our research. In other words, you can um, export data from one MU system and import that data into another MU system. For example, <clears throat> we thought it would be very useful to have access to all ECGs recorded from patients um, who had an ECG taken as part of their visit to the general, general practitioner. And in Denmark, we have the highest number of general uh, practitioners in Copenhagen. So we transferred all the ECGs taken between 2001 to 2015 to Copenhagen to our research news in Aalborg. Next, please. So here's a map of the data that we transferred. Um, all 600 general practitioners in Copenhagen, including the 400 medical practitioners, they refer their patients to eight labs in Copenhagen. Um, and then all of the ECGs are collected in a centralized lab also located in Copenhagen. So <clears throat> over the period of 15 years, 950,000 ECGs were collected from uh, about 480,000 uh, patients. We were also so fortunate that the labs gave us access to blood work, so we have both the ECG and blood from about one third of the population of Copenhagen. Next, please. Now when you, yes, so when you collect um, uh, uh, this type of data, uh, there's one problem. When you collect data over many years, not only will you have data from many different ECG machines, but each machine will use different algorithms to analyze the ECG. Also, those algorithms change over time so that each machine will use a new version of an algorithm as the software is updated. This means that in MUSE, the digital ECG parameters that we can extract, they're not standardized. And in our publications, that can create a problem. So anytime we collect our research ECGs, we need to make sure that they're reanalyzed with the same algorithm. And this is um, one of the very important features that we use in MUSE when we import data from one MUSE to another MUSE or from one site in MUSE to a different site in the same MUSE. Next, please. So in our case, when we imported the 950,000 ECGs to MUSE, we used the reanalysis um, option that you can set in the system. This way, we make sure that all ECGs that end up in one site in the ECG database are analyzed with the same and the most recent uh, version of the 12SL. Next, please. So you can see here a before and an after picture. 
a before picture um, uh, of the ECGs that we imported and an after picture. So in the left column in the red rectangle is the version that was used to analyze the original ECGs by the ECG machines. And you can see that they're not all the same. And in the right-hand column, uh, inside the rectangle, you can see that the version that we used upon reanalysis uh, is all the same. So why do we do this? Why do we do this when we perform research? Um, next, please, Jennifer. Well, we do this because when we publish our results, it's very important for us um, to write in our methods section that all ECGs um, are analyzed with the same version. And why is, it, why is this important? Well, this is important because, of course, um, we want to report findings that are caused by disease and not findings that are caused potentially by differences in uh, different algorithms. Yes. Next, please. Another feature in MUSE that um, we also use every day is um, the ability to allow researchers from many different institutions to log into the MUSE and, and then to allow um, um, and to use, um, to use the specific sites where their data is located. So we can give each, each researcher a specific profile that allows them to interact with their data in a specific way. For example, it may be that we can allow some researchers to export data and other research, researchers will then uh, not have that option. Next, please. We can also allow um, each researcher to build a personalized statement library if um, that is a requirement um, for a project. And uh, here's an example uh, from one of our projects where statements are related to the long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome. And this is a very useful uh, when we wish to tag ECGs uh, so that we can find them later. For example, if we want to analyze um, a particular subgroup of our data, uh, we have a, a meaningful tag for the groups. Next, please. <clears throat> So I also want to show you a, a number of different ways that we uh, use to extract data from news. So very often we're interested in standard ECG measurements, such as the heart rate, the PR interval, the QT interval, and so on. <clears throat> and these parameters we find um, rather easy to extract from the SQL tables in the MUSE system. And uh, I show you here an example of uh, one SQL table uh, that has those um, standard ECG measurements. So with a few clicks, this table can be exported to uh, Excel or color separated files. And it's then easy to work with in most statistical um, uh, programs we find. Um, but of course, um, sometimes we are interested in not just the standard ECG parameters, um, and um, there are more than just the standard ECG measurements available in the SQL tables. Next, please. So if you look at this template ECG, you can see that amplitude and interval measurements from all the deflections in the ECG are available. So not only that, they're available individually in each of the 12 leads of the ECG. And we're also able to export um, those intervals and measurements individually uh, on a lead, uh, lead specific basis. Next, please. So now let me give you an overview of the framework that we have for the Copenhagen General Practitioners ECG data that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So you can see here that we have new users from many different research institutions who can lock into the news. In news, they have access to the 950,000 ECGs and the ECG parameters that we uh, can measure from those ECGs. But <clears throat> we've also been able to link the ECG measurements um, to the Danish health registries. 
that has um, detailed information about the medicine and diagnosis and causes of death in these patients. And this is a very strong setup because it allows us to study uh, the associations between ECG measurements and the development of disease. Next, please. So, so for example, using the ECG database and the Danish health registries, we examined, we've examined the association between different ECG measurements and new onset atrial fibrillation. So here you can see that we've looked at heart rate, the PR interval, the QT interval, the duration of the P wave, and also the presence of interatrial block, IAB. And all of those measurements come directly from the 12SL measurements in use. Next, please. So for example, in our study of interatrial block, we use the definition of block, which is a characteristic of the P wave where the duration is prolonged or the morphology is biphasic in inferior leads, leads 2, 3, or AVF. This information can then be found in the um, cell files that were exported from the SQL tables. And we can then do our association analysis with different outcomes, as you can see on the, on the right-hand side. Next, please. So I also want to show you um, how we've been able to um, use um, existing ECG parameters to reassess some of the um, diagnostic ECG criteria that we use every day. And the example that uh, I will uh, show you is the criteria for left ventricular hypotrophy, but we're also doing the same thing for left atrial enlargement. Next, please. So here we um, used our Excel files with the 12 SL ECG measurements to quantify six different ECG criteria for left ventricular hypotrophy, as you can see here in the table. We then compared those findings to CT images uh, of, uh, yes, go back, thank you. CT images of the left ventricle uh, in nearly 5,000 patients. And we're actually surprised to find that there was only a 4% overlap between ECG criteria of left ventricular hypotrophy and organ damage by CT. In other words, the ECG criteria for left ventricular hypotrophy that we use every day in the clinic may not actually reflect the degree of organ damage. So you can see we can also use MUSE to reassess, establish criteria for disease, and then hopefully we can find ways to improve them in the future. Next, please. Another uh, useful feature uh, for research in MUSE is the search function. So let's say you want to measure the QT interval, and we want to exclude certain ECGs from our analysis. For example, we want to exclude ECGs with bundle branch block and wide QRS, because they can disturb our interpretation of the QT intervals. So we can then do a um, database search to find all of the ECGs that we wish to exclude from our analysis. Next, please. So here, for example, I wish to exclude ECGs with the diagnosis of left bundle branch block. Um, in Danish, um, uh, as you can see there in the highlight, uh, that is abbreviated VG. Uh, next, please. So we also require <clears throat> that the excluded ECGs will have a QRS duration greater than or equal to 120 milliseconds. Uh, next, please. And we then do uh, our search. And in this example here, we found a total record. Uh, uh, we found 8,000. 865 records from uh, 4,700 patients. Um, now we have um, our patients that we wish to exclude uh, 
from uh, our study. And I apologize that the statements here are in Danish, but I can tell you uh, that they all have the same diagnosis, and that is um, reflecting the search, namely uh, left bundle branch block and wild QRS. Next, please. <clears throat> And as you can see here, um, these searches translate directly into the methods sections in our research papers, where we describe what, what patients, uh, patient groups we have excluded. Here, for example, we've excluded patients with bundle branch block and YQRS, what I just showed you. Next, please. It's also possible, as many of you may know, to manually measure intervals and amplitudes uh, in MUSE. And this could be done uh, 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 in a blinded manner and, and, uh, uh, to the 12SL measurements in different ways. Next, please. This is important because we can then use the manual measurements to quantify the agreement between the automatic measurements from 12SL and our manual measurements. And many times in the review process of our uh, research, we are actually asked to do this type of comparison uh, on a random um, sample, small sample of the data. So we find this also a very useful feature and it directly uh, uh, translate into, uh, translates into our research papers. Um, Next, please. Sometimes we also uh, use the 12 SL uh, measurements from MUSE uh, to, uh, together with the Danish health registries to assess the risk of cardiovascular death. Here, uh, I've shown two studies that we're doing, uh, one with the QT interval and cardiovascular death, and another study with the morphology of the T wave and cardiovascular death. Next, please. Now, now we can use our ECG measurements in combination with conventional risk models for cardiovascular death. So here we can see that for a 55-year-old woman with no apparent um, disease, her risk of cardiovascular death uh, within one to 10 years is not affected very much by the different levels of QT interval, only about one to 2% when the QT interval fluctuates. Next, please. Yes. In contrast, <clears throat> if you have a 65 year old man with several, no, go back, please. Yes, in contrast, if you, have a, if you take a 65-year-old um, man with several comorbidities, his risk of cardiovascular death depends very much on the magnitude of the QT interval on the ECG. Because you can see his risk changes 20 to 30% when the QT interval fluctuates. So this is just one way to use ECG measurements from the MUSE to improve conventional risk models for cardiovascular death. Next, please. Yes. So now we've come to uh, what I think is one of the most powerful um, research features um, in MUSE, and that is the um, ability to export the ECG in different formats, such as um, PDF format or XML format. Next, please. Many times we will um, export PDF versions of the EGGs, and then we will circulate them for review. Many times we will um, do uh, measurements of specific intervals on these PDFs, um, uh, and we will then use those measurements um, to compare with the um, uh, automatic uh, 12 SL measurements. Next, please. But I think 
Um, the most important format that we use in our research um, is the uh, XML format that we can export from, from news because here in, we have everything in uh, one single file. We have the um, annotations of fiducial points so we can know where all the intervals are measured on the ECG waveforms. We have the ECG measurements in the measurement matrix. I've highlighted uh, some of them here in the red uh, rectangle. But more importantly, um, we also have access to the uh, raw ECG waveforms because they're included in the export of the XML files. Next, please. And I say that um, the XML format is very useful for research because they allow us to use these XML files in custom written software that we develop ourselves. So here's an example of a graphical user interface that we've built in MATLAB, where we import the um, XML files exported from Muse, and then we show the EGGs using the 12SL fiducial points from Muse. So we don't have to write our own algorithms, uh, we can simply use um, the fiducial points that have been validated already. Next, please. So with the XML files, we can do uh, also um, advanced signal processing. For example, here we've transformed the ECG into a vector cardiogram. And you may ask, well, why on earth would we uh, want to do that? Next, please. But we do that because we can then derive novel ECG measurements from the uh, XML files. Sometimes we will see uh, no uh, ECG parameters in research, and we may want to uh, derive them ourselves. Um, and this is an example of one of those more recent uh, ECG uh, markers of heart failure, the so-called QIS area or the QIST area, that we have um, derived directly from the vector cardiogram um, that we obtain from the new XML files. Next, please. <clears throat> because for in talking about novel uh, use of the ECG, I also want to um, give you an example um, of how we use the new XML files in deep learning with neural networks. Um, so in one example, we have um, compressed the ECG into a simplified description of the ECG by uh, a few uh, reduced set of features, for example, 30 features. And if those 30 features uh, capture all the uh, information in the ECG, then they can also be used to reconstruct the original ECG again with little or no loss. And hopefully we can then find meaning uh, for these features. We can see, for example, what happens if we change one of the features, and here apparently feature number 16 controls the amplitude of some segments, and feature number 10 then controls uh, other features. So how do we then um, plan um, to use this type of research, uh, this type of um, um, advanced signal processing? Uh, next, please. So in the, in the ideal uh, situation, uh, I, I talked about uh, extracting uh, 30 or describing the ECG with uh, 30 features. So in the, uh, in, 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 a, in the ideal situation, we could have a, let's say, 30 dimensional uh, space of features. And I've shown here a very colorful plot of only um, two-dimensional uh, two dimensional representation of this uh, feature space. And in this space, similar uh, diagnosis from the um, Danish health registries uh, might cluster together. So if we record a new ECG and we ask ourselves um, this a question, where in this cluster, cluster will the new ECG be placed? And what are the diagnoses closest to this new ECG? 
then we can go on to find the most probable phenotype of this new ET gene, but we can do even more than that. We can then ask the neural network to indicate on the ET gene why a specific diagnosis is likely. And this can be done uh, with the so-called attention mapping technique. And here you can see that it has indicated a 99% chance of right atrial hypotrophy, and it has also indicated in red the uh, upsloping part of the P wave, which then would be indicative of uh, the right atrium being enlarged. So now, not only will you have information about a diagnosis, but we'll also be able um, to open the black box that we usually talk about when we talk about neural networks, and then we can understand why a particular diagnosis was suggested, but also what is the certainty associated with um, this diagnosis. Um, next, please. Yes. So this will be uh, my final slide here. Um, so you can see uh, uh, in a summarized view here how uh, we might be able to um, use MUSE um, in the neural network um, framework. So we um, suggest to use MUSE um, to pave the way to new knowledge and potentially better treatment. So how can we do this? Let's say you go to your doctor, he records an ECG and uses <clears throat> then a neural network to get the most likely diagnosis. A phenotype is suggested. With this diagnosis in hand, we then go on to um, look up how people with this diagnosis historically have been treated and what their chances were of survival. We feed this information back to the doctor so he can make an informed decision about the treatment of his patient. And then hopefully this new knowledge will then lead to better treatment um, of the patients. Yes? Um, Last slide, please. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, this concludes my um, presentation. Um, thank you very much.